District Attorney Belton here. Good morning. Mr. Belton, can you prepare a white card? Sure. Thank you. I think you're right to do a mass uh, break at one time. Second district attorney, but we've, we've lost our quorum. I think everybody yes, needs a break. No we rush. Still. Thank you, District Attorney Belton, for being here today and, 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 and willing to come to testify about uh, the incident involving Rob Green. Ronald Green, if you'd like to make any comments, however you want to handle it, it's fine with, with me as chairman. Yes, and I would like to make a statement as well. Sure, please. First and foremost, I'd like to give all the praise, honor, and glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Secondly, I would like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of this committee, uh, for seeking the truth for Mr. Ronald Green and his family. Transparency is the key, and I think that's the only way we can... Um, seek justice and obtain justice for the Green family. And I appreciate your service, not only for allowing me to speak here today, but also the citizens of the state of Louisiana. I thank them for allowing me to be here as well. Thank you. On I, May, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sure. And my name, for the record, is John, John Belton. I'm the district attorney for Lincoln and Union Parishes um, in North Louisiana. On May 10th, 2019, Mr. Ronald Green tragically died while in the custody of Louisiana State Police. My heart breaks for Mr. Ronald Green and his family. His mother, Ms. Mona Hardin, is very strong and resolute in seeking justice for her son. What I respect about her the most is her unselfish commitment to justice for all. When I spoke to her last week, she said, and I quote, I'm not seeking justice just for Ronnie, but for the other families who are experiencing the same injustices. I've been quoted as saying that the video I saw of Mr. Ronald Green while in the custody of state police is the worst thing I've ever seen. That quote accur accurately reflects my reaction, and I stand by that statement today. On September 9th, 2019, after my initial viewing of the video, I believed state and federal crimes were committed, including federal civil rights violations. On that same day, I immediately took action by requesting the United States Department of Justice to conduct an independent investigation of the circumstances surrounding Mr. Green's death, including whether any federal and or civil rights violations occur, occurred, which can only be prosecuted by the United States Attorney's Office. In doing so, I did not, and I repeat, I did not recuse my office. In fact, I have maintained prosecutorial power 
to prosecute state crimes which occurred in my district, specifically the Parish of Union. In order to prevent impending the federal investigation, I'm sorry, impeding the federal investigation, I was asked by the United States Attorney's Office not to institute formal proceedings in state court until they initiated prosecution on the federal level. I agreed for the following primary reasons. First, what I perceive as the necessity to have a complete and independent investigation since both the Louisiana State Police and the Union Parish Sheriff's Office had officers on the scene. Secondly, the vast resources that the United States Department of Justice could bring to the table to benefit the investigation and bring justice for the Green family. Finally, notwithstanding the possibility of pursuing homicide charges, I felt that the federal rights violations would expand the potential for penalties upon conviction as compared to some of the potential state charges. All of the interested parties deserve nothing less than a fully resourced independent investigation with the ultimate goal of justice, including justice for Ms. Mona Hardin and the family of Mr. Ronald Green. Since I involve the United States Department of Justice, additional evidence has been gathered. For example, the forensic pathologist had issued a supplemental report which eliminates, and I repeat, eliminates the motor vehicle collision as a cause of death, when initially the autopsy report said it did. Additionally, I have now been provided with the Clary video, like all of us, by state police investigators, which was not in the original case file submitted to me on August 20th, 2019. Regarding state crimes, I plan to take further action as soon as all available evidence is in my possession, including testimony that was gathered here and in the past by this committee. Last week, I contacted Ms. Mona Harding to let her know that the United States Attorney Brandon Brown recently advised me that the United States Department of Justice is no longer requesting that I withhold prosecuting state charges while their investigation is, is ongoing. He has committed to sharing their resources, which include their investigative reports to date and access to FBI, FBI investigators to aid my office in prosecuting any and all state charges. Accordingly, after receiving the United States Department of Justice investigative report, I will request that a special grand jury be impaneled in Union Parish. My plans is to present all relevant evidence to the grand jury for their determination of appropriate charges. I have confidence in the United States Attorney Brandon Brown, his office, the Department of Justice, and like all of you, I eagerly await the results of their two and a half year investigation. I believe it is of the utmost importance that Mr. Ronald Green family and the public as a whole be provided complete and truthful answers about what happened to him. I will never, and I repeat, I will never make prosecutorial decisions due to political pressure or public opinion. I, like all prosecutors, must adhere to seeking justice based on the law and evidence. I will follow this standard as I always have in the 30 years I've been a prosecutor. No one is above the law, no one. Based on the evidence I have seen and the investigation thus far, I believe some of the officers' actions were above the law, and they committed criminal acts, including violating Mr. Green's civil rights. Under our Constitution, everyone has a constitutional right, everyone has a constitutional right to a due process and fair and impartial hearing in court. Mr. Green was not afforded that right. Since the federal investigation is ongoing, I am very limited to what I can say, especially code of uh, professional conduct, code of professional responsibility prevents me from saying certain things about the merits of the case. As I have previously stated publicly, ethically, I cannot promise an indictment, nor can I promise a conviction. I did, however, promise to Mr. Green's family on numerous occasions that I will continue to seek justice 
for them as I do for all victims and the people of Louisiana. I have never wavered from that commitment and I will never waver in that commitment today or ever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, thank you. I really appreciate your comments. Um, let me ask you a question. It's one I've gotten a lot from a lot of people is who um, in the U.S. Attorney's Office told you um, to not institute charges while the investigation was pending? Acting the U.S. Attorney, acting U.S. Attorney at that time was Alec Van Hook. Okay. As well as the lead prosecutor on the case, Mr. Luke Walker. Okay. Was it Mr. Walker who told you or was it Mr. Van Hook? Both. Both. Okay. And my second question is, and I, I don't, I always am hesitant to, 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 to do this kind of stuff, but it was my impression when Colonel Reeves testified that he was under the impression that you were not pursuing charges, that that was his conclusion when he testified to us. Was that, if that was my impression, was that, was that, is that an accurate statement, I guess is what I'm trying to say? Where did he get that from would be a better way to put it? I don't recall where he received that from, but he did not receive that from me. My position has always been to seek justice for the Green family, and that I've, uh, that is unwa unwavering for me. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to the committee for – and look, I, one thing I want to do is I, I want to tell you I appreciate the timeline you gave in us, um, with the PowerPoint slide. Um, I asked some questions about it, but I'm going to let some other people talk first, and I'm going to ask you about it after. Representative Marceau. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. And I, too, want to thank you for the timeline. It, it really helped us to figure out kind of what you knew, when you knew, uh, the video that you were not presented with initially. Um, so, And I know it's, you're limited to what you can uh, tell us today. Yes. But you talked about state and federal crimes that you saw uh, being committed based upon the evidence that you have looked at. And you also spoke about Union Parish Sheriff being on the scene. Is there any possibility or are they being investigated as well um, from by the U.S. Department of Justice? Yes. And is there any possibility, because we have not heard a lot about them. We've heard a lot about state police, but we've not heard much about the Union Parish Sheriff's Office. Um, and so there is a possibility that they, too, may be charged with some state or federal crimes? The way that I must answer that question is that there, there are under investigation. There are under investigation. Yes. Um, and you do believe that you, what you saw as a, how long have you been? A, 30 years. 30 years. I mean, my 31st year. 31st year. Mm. Okay. Civil rights violations, you do believe that you saw. Uh, being violated in, in those that evidence that you've reviewed thus far yes thus far mm -hmm. I, again I, I don't want to make you open yourself up uh, to anything else but I do want to thank you for the timeline and clarity on when when you first got this case no one gave you that clarity video is that accurate that is correct and so that was withheld from you I did not receive it until I did not know anything about it. Um, I, I received a file on August twentieth, twenty nineteen, and I think that video surfaced sometime in twenty twenty. Right? Is that is that would that be normal, in your opinion, for a file to come to you uh, for investigating purposes and a video of that magnitude to be left out? Do you think that that's normal? Based upon my experience, that is not normal. That's not normal. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Thank, thank you, Representative Morceau. Representative Nelson. Hey, D.A. Bilton. How are you doing today? Fine, thank you. How are you, sir? Oh, living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> I have, you know, the best thing is having two committee meetings at the same time. Yes. Um, but but thank yeah, you no for worries. your service, sir. Appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so the first thing I'd ask is, is it common for the state to pause an investigation or prosecution during a federal investigation. I feel like all the, you know, Armand Arbery, and you might have seen that we had a sheriff in St. Tammany Parish that had concurrent state and federal investigations. You know, they get charges on both, and it's kind of gone at the same time. In my, I've never seen DOJ say, don't press any charges on a state level on separate charges, well, even while they're pursuing these civil rights actions. Is that a normal thing? Has that ever happened to you before? It's not uncommon. Um, I, I'm, it, it's never happened to me before, uh, but it's not uncommon for the federal government to ask a, a local district attorney not to proceed. 
Um, can they stop me? No. Um, but I felt like it was in the best interest to get to seek justice. One reason is because you know, state police that investigated state police. And so it was important for me to make sure the evidence that I received uh, was an, came from an independent agency. I'll give you some examples. So when it, typically, a uh, city police uh, department is normally uh, investigated by either the sheriff or the state police. Uh, the parish uh, sheriff's office is typically investigated by uh, the, the state police if they ask them to come in. Um, but there's no one to investigate state police. And so in this scenario, you had a state police officer who was um, a suspect, or, or a number of them, and so it was important for an independent investigation um, to, to, to be initiated, so therefore I can get an independent review and independent facts moving forward, especially in light of some of the problems, and I won't go into the specifics, but some of the problems that um, Trooper Al Paxton and Trooper Al Brown, I mean um, Scott Brown, ran into in terms of in terms of what they wanted to present to me. I'll leave it at that. So, so they when they turned over the file, I mean when they turned over the information to you, I guess, do they recommend? They recommend that charges be brought, or I mean, is that how that works? So they recommend it to state police, as I understand it, to bring charges uh, to the colonel. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but they did not rec we talked about charges. Right. But uh, at that point in time, um, we did not present uh, to the grand jury or did not file a bill of information because I immediately uh, involved um, the United States Department of Justice. I, you know, I think I mean, similar to the questions we asked Colonel Davis, I mean, the timeline here just has become kind of ridiculous. I mean, at the end of the day, we're three years now, and presumably the troop, I mean, at least some of the troopers or whoever could be brought, charges be brought against, you know, they've just been essentially operating and working in state police this entire time. And state police has been here testifying to us this whole time that they didn't want to get involved or they didn't want to do anything because there was an ongoing criminal investigation. So they're kind of passing the buck to you. Um, I mean, for whether it's your fault or not, I mean, they're, they're passing the buck to you saying, hey, look, there's an ongoing criminal investigation. We turned everything over on, you know, what is this, uh, according to your timeline, September 9th, 2019. And so since September 9th, 2019, they've been saying the ball's in the district attorney's court. If he doesn't want to do anything, what are we supposed to do at state police? We turned over the evidence. And I, I understand they didn't turn over the Clary video. Obviously, that, was, that came up after. But even the video and the evidence that they did turn over was at least enough for the initial investigators to say, hey, this is wrong. And it was at least enough for you to say, as soon as you saw it, hey, this is wrong. We're going to turn over the federal investigators. So in any time in that, I mean, I guess the intervening two or three years, is that ever, you know, did it ever come to you that maybe this is something that we should pursue just because this seems like the feds are taking too long? Like, how did that, you know, can you tell me what your thought process is and, and just holding off that long? I mean, if the feds, if it was like a two week, 60 days, I mean, 60 days, I don't think anybody would be criticizing because we say we'll let it rather let it run. So but thank, thank you for years. your question, Representative Nelson. I really appreciate that. Uh, number one, let me say that I, I did take action. I took action immediately and, and involved the federal authorities because of their resources, because I thought it was in the best interest of the Green family uh, to bring them in um, to obtain justice for them. With respect to the timeline, I must agree with you that it has taken a long time. And um, my conversation with then U.S. Acting Attorney last summer, Alec Van Hook, I said, I'm ready to pursue, pursue these charges. It's been a long time. I've been waiting. I've been patient. Because I gave them my word. And I'm a man of my word. I gave them my word that I would wait until their investigation was complete so I can gather more information uh, and not impede their investigation. And I gave my word to the, to the Green family to make sure that I would bring justice. And so I had to balance those two promises. And when I, when I spoke to US, acting U.S. Attorney Alan Van Hook last summer, he said, John, we're going to have indictments probably in September or October. Could you just please wait? You've waited this long. I said, sure. And then it became the goalpost moved. Uh, and let me add this. I am not throwing the U.S. Attorney's Office under the bus. They work well with my office. Um, the acting U.S. Attorney at that time, Alan Van Hook, worked well with me. Uh, the new U.S. Attorney, Brandon Brown, is a f fabulous person as well, and they work well with me, keep me in informed of everything and what's going on for the most part. There's some things they can't share with me, but we, we have a very, very good working relationship. And so in November, I was told that there was a possibility that they would have an indictment in December. At that time, I called Ms. Mona Hardin and said, 
we, we're going to possibly get indictment in December. And I remember her um, response was something about the holidays and Christmas and stuff like that, that that would be really nice. But it didn't happen. And so I got a call from U.S. Brandon, U.S. Attorney Brandon Brown last week, and he shared with me that they've decided to allow me to move forward with the state charges. And I thanked him, and I immediately called uh, Ms. Mort Mona Harding on last Friday to let her know uh, of, the, of that news. And so uh, my last question, I think they're going to cut me off. Uh, do you have any kind of memo or email where that documents DOJ saying, do not, you know, we request you do not press charges or do not pursue anything? Do you have, the, do you have those actual documents? I, no, I do not. But I have but a, they if exist. you want to look at my cell phone, because uh, <laughs> I know uh, you, uh, my text messages with Mr. Brown, um, I can share with you. I didn't yeah, say my phone. Do now. us a favor and don't <laughs> smash it in your tailgate. But I'll be glad to that show you. I'll right. be glad to show you my text messages to Mr. Brown recently of this week. Uh, he indicated to me that he would get a letter from uh, to me on Friday. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. He wrote the letter Friday, uh, but that that letter needed to be approved by Washington D.C. before it was sent to me. I have that if you'd like to look at it. Okay. Yeah, I think that might be helpful. Okay. Thank sure. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Um, I'm, let me kind of go over some things with you. I want to. So, May 10th, 2019, we have the incident. Um, then I think you meet with um, September 9th, 19. I think you also then meet with uh, Scott, Albert, Cliff Strider, Lori James, and Russ. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and that's when you see the the video for the first time, and they review y'all review the case. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. You have to call Your Honor. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I don't have that. Uh, oh, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you. Um, and then I think it, it is my understanding from the testimony received that uh, Strider, I don't know where he comes from, whose office he's in. He recommends the U.S. Attorney's Office because of potential civil rights violations. He was in my office at that time. And, and then you agreed with the recommendation at that time. Is kind of what the, the, I understood the meeting. I wasn't there, obviously, but that's what I kind of understand. Is that correct? I left that. I left the meeting room. My office is next to the conference room. I, I exited the conference room, walked into my office, picked up the phone, and called the U.S. Attorney's Office immediately. So that's when you called. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I think um, you meet with on about a month later, October 13, 2019, you meet with people in the governor's office and representatives of Louisiana State Police about the review release video. Is that correct? That that's is correct. A, I think that's on your timeline. It is. Who was in that meeting? Do you remember? That was regarding the release of the video, if I'm not mistaken. That's what your PowerPoint Colonel says. Colonel Reeves, Matthew Block, myself. My first assistant, Lori James, um, and another attorney from the uh, the governor's office. Okay. I don't recall her name. Was it Tina, possibly? Yeah, I think so. Yes, sir. Okay. And then, and, I, and a lot of this information I'm also getting from testimony we have. I think um, Trooper Paxton says that he sees you um, on our, on 10 23 2019. He's working detail at a Louisiana Tech event during the campaign. Do you remember that? Yes. And then he says that that's when he first hears the phrase that Reeves told you it was awful but lawful. Do you recall that? Yes. And is that what Reeves told you? Yes. So according to Colonel Reeves, and did Colonel Reeves tell you that in the 2019 meeting when y'all talked about the release of the video? When did he tell you that, I guess, is what I'm trying to find? At that, at that event at Louisiana Tech University. Um. Did you have any conversations with the governor at that event about the same thing you talked to? I did not. Okay. Then on September 16, 2020, Matthew Blocks texted you uh, and asked you that a moment to talk. Do you recall that? What date was that? That was um, September 16, 2020. I know this is yes. hard. This is yes. a three-year investigation. I'm not trying to yes. trick you. I'm I, just I, I, to... I, I do recall that, yes. Um, and then... That was that moment to talk in reference to the Ronald Green matter. I would assume yes, because that's the only other, that's the only issue that we have that it's common. And then October fifth, uh, Block texts you again, requesting to talk later that afternoon. That would also be about the Ronald Green matter. Is that correct? I would only assume so. Yes. Um, and then October seventh, Block texts you again, and says if and when the governor decides to release the video, and then you, uh, no, you. Or maybe you, 
I'm not sure if you maybe you texted Matthew that, and I said I greatly appreciate you. And the governor would be also about Ronald Green, correct? Yes. Um, so you were leaving it up to John Bell or the governor. I'm sorry to to re to discuss the releasing of the video. Is that correct? That's what I'm gathering from these text messages. And what's that date again? I'm sorry. Um, that is October seventh, two thousand twenty. And that's when they visited my office. Is that what you're saying? I don't know. If they visit your. I think they visited your office on the twenty. It looks like the thirteenth. Uh -huh. And then you in of nineteen, and this is a year later, and you you and Matthew Block are exchanging text messages about the video. Okay. And then, according to the text messages, I believe on October eleventh, Matthew Box texts you offering uh, to arrange for Colonel Reeves to pick you up in the air in, in the in the state troopers helicopter. Mm -hmm. you, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I um the only the only times I talked to the governor's office regarding the Ronald Green matter would be one was a policy issue, the second one was the release of the video, um, and. I think it was meeting with the family, yes, if I'm not mistaken. And, and you were aware when the state police came to pick you up that they had potential criminal charges. I think that's one of the reasons why you said that um, you turned it over to the U.S. Attorney's Office because you knew they were involved. Yes. And then on October 12th, you texted, um, I think, the contact info for Alex Van Horn, who was the U.S. Attorney, to Matthew Block. Is that correct? That's correct. But, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's so Matthew could talk, Matthew Block could talk to the U.S. Attorney about the case. So, uh, for clarity, yeah, um, sure. I so I about. received a call from the, from the governor's office, um, and if I recall, it was the governor himself asking me if I was okay with the release of the video, and I said, sure. Um, I don't have a problem with releasing the video. However, since the federal government is involved, we need to we need to make sure they're okay with it. Uh, he asked me to contact um, the federal authorities. I did. Uh, and, and, and they indicated that they w were not comfortable in releasing the video, but that we can show it to the family. And I think you have a letter confirming that. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then on October 14th, you texted Matthew Blocks, um, offering answering questions from the Black Caucus. Do you recall that? If I, if I make, if I texted him, I'm sure I did. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me during this, during October of 2020, you're you're in somewhat frequent contact with the governor's office. Is that fair to say? Not frequent. Um, if I guess that that I was I was in contact with him about the release of the video, and meeting with the family and a policy issue. But from, since then, before then, and since then, I've not been in contact with them on a regular basis. Um, and then on April 24, 2021, there's another meeting. I think this is when you see the Belton. I think this is when you see the Clary video for the first time. Is that correct? Yes. And then that meeting is um, you, Lori, and Louis Jones. Is that right, Louis Jones? I'm sorry, L Louis Jones. That's correct. I apologize if I mess up anybody's name. He's my chief felony prosecutor. Okay. Um, Y'all discuss possible charges at that time. Yes. Um, who, and I th who else was in that? Was that anybody else in that meeting? Um, well, let me back up. Is that with the governor staff, or I don't have my, my notes with me? I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'm trying to get, and I know that's. I'm not trying to trick you. Anything. I'm just trying right, to get the, right, the right. timeline. Um, right. I can look on here too. Where, so, on yours it says, on your on your PowerPoint it says receive supplement from LSP with Clary video. So yes. I think this is when you yes. see the Clary. Who else was in that meeting? Do you so know? that was when C Colonel Davis. I requested a meeting with Colonel Davis because of that release of the video that I was not aware of, did not possess at the time. And I wanted to talk to him about it, and also because he was just appointed not uh, long before then, that, that that date, and I wanted to um, talk to him about the case as well. Okay. And um, on May 20th, 2021, you meet with Colonel Davis again, and this time, I believe, uh, well, you in your PowerPoint says that Doug Kane and Chavez Cammon are also there to discuss the 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 Clary video. Do you recall that? Meeting? Yes. Now, a lot of the information I'm coming from, I'm getting from all this, is from Albert Paxton's uh, notes. One of the weird things, well, not weird, but uh, in a bad way, unusual, is he keeps very detailed notes more than I think most people do. Mm -hmm. He he is told that from somebody, I think, regarding this meeting, that Kane tells you that his supplemental report contains lies in it. Do you do you know what? Do you recall Doug Kane telling you that? That Kane tells me. That his supplemental report contains yes. lies in it? Yes. I don't recall. 
Do you remember what Doug Kane told you in that meeting? Uh, if it was about the Claridge vi video, there was a discussion as to whether or not certain crimes uh, had been committed. And it was a conversation whereby my office and Louisiana State Police went back and forth with respect to our opinion of the facts in the video and whether or not crimes had been committed. Um, did, did Reeves or Kane ever tell you that the Paxton report was not accurate? I, I don't recall. Um, he may have told my first assistant, Lori James, uh, but I don't recall. He may have. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you say he, you were saying Kane or Reeves? I thought you were talking about Mr. Paxton. About the Paxton report. I think Lori James told, my understanding is Lori James told Paxton that Kane and Reeves said that his report wasn't accurate. That's how I Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, now I understand your, your I, I don't, rec that could have happened, but I don't recall. Um, um, and, and, and let me say this, I'm, I'm very leery and I have to be very, very uh, cautious about um, any conversations I had because I do know that Louisiana State Police is on the federal investigation. So um, I, and I've met with the federal investigators as well as um, the prosecutors about all the meetings I've had. So I need to be very careful about what um, what was said and what, what was, wasn't was said. And I totally understand. But yes, yes. I mean, I'm not aware that Doug Kane yeah. or Colonel Davis or Colonel Reeves are under investigation. In fact, Colonel Reeves... No, 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 no. Colonel Davis is not on the investigation. Colonel Reeves is not on the investigation. Right. So, so my, my question is, did Colonel Reeves tell you that... The, or tell anybody in your office to your understanding that the Paxson report was not accurate? I don't recall that. There seems to be a lot of hesitation in that answer. I'm just well, I, they said a lot. I mean, I, that's a, probably a paraphrase. And um, for me to be able to verify that, I would have to say a lot and explaining everything in detail uh, and then make a conclusion or summary. So I'm very careful about what I'm saying tonight because I don't want to jeopardize uh, the investigation nor uh, taint a potential grand jury or petted jury because I want justice for the Green family. If Lori James had reported, you wouldn't. Lori James has not ever been known to, to say things that are untrue to, to your knowledge. She's a very honest person. So if she said that to One of the most probably, honest people I know. Okay. Then on May 20th, 2021, you texted Matthew Block a copy of, of your press release or statement, however you want to call it, about Ron Green. Is that correct? Yes. And I also texted uh, U.S. Attorney's Office as well. Okay. And then May 25th, 2021, um, you texted Matthew, Matthew Block again wanting to meet, um, the Green family wanting to meet. You're letting him know that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you included the phrase, please let the governor know. Is yes. Is that correct? That's correct. So you were communicating primarily with Matthew Block and assuming he was communicating with the governor about the case. That is correct. Um. Then I think, and then this gets confusing to me, I'm trying to find some clarity in it. Um, on July 12th through 13th, I think you requested a meeting with Paxton maybe, or Colonel Davis. I can't quite figure out from, pa from Paxton's note. Um, do you recall that? Um, yes. And? I think I requested a meeting with Paxton and Brown, Trooper Paxton, Paxton and Brown. Okay, yes. did y'all end up meeting? Yes. Okay, I think I might have met July 15th, but I'm not entirely sure. Mm -hmm. That's correct? Yes. And then, and let me ask you this. In his notes, uh, Trooper Paxton does an interview with Ducote and Boudreau regarding Officer Turner, and he tells the interviewers that Lamar Davis and Doug Kane told Belton that Paxton should not be trusted. Is that accurate? I don't recall Colonel Davis ever telling me that. What about Doug Kane? I don't recall him telling me that. Again, it may have been said, um, but I don't recall ever them saying that. And then you met with Van Buren Davis, and then it, I think it just says LSP investigators on November 22nd, 2021. Is that correct? Yes. Do you remember what the, the what was the purpose in, or what was discussed in that meeting? I can tell you that every meeting I met, I had with the Louisiana State Police dealt with the Ronald Green matter or the release of the Ronald Green video or the Clara video, the, the new surf, the surface uh, Clara video that um, I received later. Um, so if we did meet, it was about and um, about the Ronald Green matter. Yes.
Let me ask you this. Have you been watching these hearings that we've been I've doing? watched some, not all of them. <laughs> I can understand. Um, did you learn anything new during these that you did not know before? I will be subpoenaing, uh, send a subpoena to you to, to receive uh, certain transcripts, yes. Okay. Very interesting information that I think can be helpful to the case. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Representative Jordan has a question. Good morning. I, I guess it's, yeah. Uh, I'm on, yeah. Good morning, uh, Good Diego. Morning. How you doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Look, I'm I'm going to try to be brief with this, but did, you you heard my questioning of the colonel earlier, right? Yes. All right. Let me ask you something. I'm look. I'm just a country lawyer. I'm not. A, I'm not a 31 year prosecutor, but but I'm going to make it as simple as I can. Let's say you and I we decided to become criminals today, and we said we're going to rob a bank, right? And but we, I, I decide before we go do it. Hey, look, we're not gonna cause anybody harm. We're not gonna do anything like that. We're just gonna get the money and we're gone. And in the process of doing that, and I'm gonna make you the trigger man. You decide you shoot and kill somebody, and we're gone. Now, can we both be prosecuted for the same crime? Can we both be prosecuted for murder? Yes. All right. Uh, if me and you, we decide we're gonna fight somebody and we jump. I'm not going to use, we'll, we'll, we'll jump Bacala. I'm going to use him. And we start fighting on Bacala, and you pull out your gun and you shoot Bacala. Can we both be charged for the same crime? Yes. All right. Now, I'm going to look at, I'm looking at second degree murder here. Second degree murder is the killing of a human being when the offender has a specific intent to kill or inflict great bodily harm. Did, in your opinion, did, did Chris Hollinsworth intend to inflict great bodily harm on Ronald Green? Publicly, I've said I believe crimes have been committed. I said that today. All right. Um, because of uh, the code of professional responsibility, I am limited as to what I can say. It's about all I can say because I don't want to jeopardize this case, a case that I want justice for, the no. Green family. I don't want to jeopardize that. And for me to well, answer that question um, would, would potentially jeopardize right. the process. So let's, so let's, let's just, all right, good enough. I'm over. And I do have personal opinions, by the way. That's <laughs> right. I know you, uh, that's right. And, and, and so let's do it this way. I'm going to tell you, in my opinion, I believe that he intended to inflict great bodily harm on Ronald Green. Work with me on that. So now, um, we had, how many other officers were at the scene when Chris Hollinsworth inflicted that great bodily harm? That's my words, not yours. When they inflicted, when he inflicted great bodily harm on Ronald Green? Again, because of the Code of Professional Responsibility. I, I'm not I'm just asking how many I, officers, I, my only, I'm, my, I'm limited as to what I can say, and that would get into the weeds and details of that particular investigation and uh, I don't want to jeopardize the process. No problem. Because I let's, want justice. Let's just the, assume the that family. there were at least three other officers, and I'm going to say one of those officers was Kerry York, right? Let's just um, work with me. Now, if those officers were there, he committed this crime, just like you and I went to rob this bank, and maybe they didn't intend for him to inflict this great bodily harm or kill Ronald Green, but it happened. So, so the difference in your hypothet is that you and I were involved in the first hypothet, mm -hmm. and so I can talk about you and I. That's, but, that's fine. But, but the second hypothet includes particular names of particular officers, I, and I am preventing, um, prevent, right. prevented from even making any type of comments or conclusions based upon that, uh, your hypothet. That's because all of right. Names individuals. I cannot name particular individuals, nor can I cite particular crimes, but I can say crimes have been committed, and, and that's about I, it. I'm, I'm fine with that. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think everybody gets the point. Mm -hmm. So if, if that happened... And even though maybe they didn't intend to do that, or I, I, I use a different example since we go that way. Let's say four officers arrived at a scene. One of the officers decides to beat a man, inflict great bodily harm on him, beat him to death. The other ones are there. Maybe they didn't necessarily intend, but they participate. And, and let's go a step further. They even participated by maybe dragging the guy after he was handcuffed and some other things and did that now yeah. now work with me just for a second because i got limited time here they could hypothetically all be charged with the same crime theoretically if correct there, if there's conspiracy yes okay so now i i just want to take it a, a, a bit further now and the reason why i actually if you if you Listen to my questioning of the colonel 
when we were specifically talking about Doug Cain, he said his criteria for keeping him on staff was, and I'm paraphrasing this, though, but his criteria was because he was not a danger to the public or himself. He said, if, if I thought they were a danger to the public or themselves, then I would at least put them on administrative leave. Now, all I'm saying is, if somebody could possibly, possibly, if officers could possibly be uh, charged with murder, and we already had Scott Brown said that he believes did you see Scott Brown's testimony last time? Yes. All right. And so you you saw when he said to me All that right, he, the five minute marks are wrapping up right I, here. I'm I'm getting very close here. <laughs> that he was tortured and murdered. Yes. You heard that, right? Yes. So I guess my question to you would be: Should officers that are in that position still be engaging with the public? So. Um, I'm the district attorney for the third judicial district, as you well know, and I run my office based upon my um, moral compass and uh, the rules and regulations and policies that I have in place. Um, I I don't want to manage the Louisiana State Police because that is that's not what I do. That's Lieutenant Colonel Davis. Um, that's his that's his responsibility and his job. And I don't want to run his office. For That's him. fine. Look, and here's, here's my last deal. And I'm coming back to Doug Kane. You said that you had a difference of opinion as to whether charges should be filed or what the charges should be. Is that correct? I think that's been made public, yes. All right. And so that was, was it a vehement disagreement or was it? I would say yes. Okay. So I can assume that Doug Kane did not want charges or disagree with the charges that you listed should, that should have been filed against the officers. We did not agree. Okay. Uh, and then lastly. I, I thought we just did lastly. Well, this is lastly. <laughs> this is lastly. You, you, you said that Colonel Reeves was not under investigation. You said that Colonel Davis was not under investigation. But you were silent as to whether Doug Kane was under investigation. Do you want to remain silent on that? Uh, well, I, I only know that he's under investigation with respect to uh, IA within the Louisiana State Police. I do know there is an ongoing federal investigation involved in the Louisiana State Police. All right. I think that answers the question. Mm. All right. Representative Villio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good Mr. morning. Mr. Belton, pleasure to see you again. Likewise. Um, and, and let me just say, I so appreciate your adherence to the rules of ethics, and, and I think that the members of this committee have to caution themselves to in no way jeopardize um, any future prosecution. Um, as a former prosecutor and for my colleagues, particularly, uh, well, Rep. Nelson's not here, um, but I can assure Rep. Nelson and others that it is common practice to pause an investigation in favor of the U.S. Attorney's Office. You would agree you have concurrent jurisdiction, correct? That is correct. But, but it's a common courtesy, and the reason I know that so well as a prosecutor should be no surprise to anyone here how much I hate it giving up my cases to the U.S. Attorney's Office when asked because I wanted to try them myself. Correct. Um, but it was a, a courtesy that was generally, if not always, extended, correct? That is correct. Thank you. Um, the only thing I have a question on, and I do appreciate the timeline as well, like my colleagues, um, and as the chairman established, the incident occurred May 10, 2019. And I believe you testified that you received the file from state police August 20th of 2019, correct? That is correct. Now, clearly this was a highly publicized event in your area, was it not? At that time, it was not. It was not. In fact, I was not aware of it until September 19th. Although it was, although it was um, delivered to my office on August 20th of 2019, um, I was not aware and did not see the video until uh, September uh, 9th, 2019. Okay. Um, so in between that time, you did not, and, and, and this is what I want to establish, did you have any conversations with the governor or his staff? During that time, no. No. Okay. The only phone call I made on that day was to the United States Department of Justice. On what day? The September 10th, 2019? September 9th. 9th, 2000. 2019, when you saw the video. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's all I yeah, have. Because there was very little um, news articles about it. Okay. Um, in fact, we even Googled and tried to find some news articles. There were very few, and it was oh, not it was not, it was not a headliner at that time. I believe the initial article tracked 
the language of the text between Colonel Reeves and the governor. I believe it was in the Star. Is there a new star or something? The Monroe New Star, yes. Monroe mm -hmm. New Star. Correct. Right. And, and the, according to your knowledge, that was pretty much the only article at the time? Yes, that, that I can recall, yeah. Because at that time, I think it was being reported that it was a traffic fatality, correct? That's what I've been told. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony. And that's why I mentioned earlier in the forensic pathology report, um, in the supplemental report, she removed that as a cause of his death. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Representative Bacala with a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. The uh, when when the the video or the case file was delivered to you, or you first had you first saw it on September ninth. Did when you re did you actually reviewed everything on that day? Yes. Okay, so it wasn't just delivered and it sat on your desk. You grabbed it. You saw it. At least, and it was an incomplete investigation. We know today, correct? I mean, that is certain correct. videos, mm -hmm. but so what you saw was a partial uh, report, I, I would guess, or an incomplete investigation, not by design, but by the fact that certain information was uh, not discovered by the investigators who presented that report. That's correct. How long did it take you sitting down and look? And, and was somebody looking over your shoulder? Were y'all reviewing it together, or did you do it in private? So it was myself, um, two of my prosecutors, or three three other prosecutors. Uh, my first assistant, Lori James, uh, my chief felony prosecutor, Lewis Jones, and one of my assistant DAs at that time, Clifford Strider. So yeah. yeah. So we all looked at it together. So um, this is DA's office. There's nobody in there but but you and your employees. And well, the two investigators. Okay, that's what uh, I meant. Uh, Albert Paxton, yeah. Trooper Paxton, and also Trooper Brown. All right, were present. Yes. And how long did it take? I mean, it just like an hour and a half, two hours. Oh no, we were there all minutes. day, <laughs> all day long. Yes, so yes. all day long, you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, was there any doubt in your mind that 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 it it couldn't end there with that meeting. Something had to take place. Something, it had to go forward. Absolutely. So as as a first-time guy looking at it, it was obvious. And look, we know law enforcement and prosecution is all about judgments, personal judgments. A, a jury is about a personal judgment whether they feel there is evidence sufficient. You feel, you, you have a personal judgment. Would you say that anybody who reviewed that document who was a reasonable person could do anything but come to a conclusion that this is probably this doesn't I'm, I'm i'm trying to recognize your restriction but anybody who saw that that report and saw those videos and not even counting the videos that weren't part of that report it was obvious that uh this this required further attention you think any reasonable person would come to that conclusion it's the only conclusion in my mind that someone can come to and and would you say that any reasonable person who would who would defend the actions out there based on what they saw that they either didn't review it at all i mean could you find any any uh and this isn't about guilt or innocence this is about good police and bad police and okay so i don't want to bring this into the criminal world is there any way, shape, or form you would use this as a training video about how to how to conduct police work? <laughs> Absolutely. This is a good training video. Um, about how I, not to do things, right? Correct. And let me say this. Um, my uncle, uh, Joseph Belton, was uh, one of the first African-American police officers in the little town I grew up in in Evangeline Parish, uh, Basel, Louisiana. And I, I fell in love with him and his, and his service to our community. And um, I do respect and honor all of our police officers, men and women in uniform. Um, they do a great job in protecting us. Um, unfortunately, there are bad actors in every profession, um, even in even the legal profession, as we well know. Um, and so I want to make sure that that is also said today. Um, yes, but, sir. But, I, but, I agree but, with but you. But when there are bad actors, um, 
and there's a video of it, I think it's important. Not, I'm not necessarily talking about any particular video, but yeah, any video well, where, where let, bad let actors me, are. Let me get um, to let me get to my sure, last ahead, part of this thing it, yes. before I get cut off. Yes. Uh, and based on that, based on the fact that any reasonable person looking at that video say this is wrong, this shouldn't happen. Aside from the criminal side and trying to to maneuver from from evidence to a, a grand jury to a potential prosecution, I think anybody should also come to the conclusion is these people don't need the police another day till this till this is finalized. Would you agree? So I think that um, I can say this. I'm trying to point to a failure here <laughs> that even if we not even if we take the criminal out. There's a failure to administratively act, whether it's by bad policy or, or indifference. There's a, I think there's a responsibility to act, to take, even, not, not the criminal side, mm -hmm. to say, I'm sorry, buddy, you can't carry a gun anymore. Yes. I'm sorry, agree, you, can't chase, you. you can't chase speeders anymore. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Now. And, yes, I, and I, I think that if the video is so obvious that, 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 as we established earlier, that something needs to happen here, whether it's a whether it's poor policy or poor judgment or indifference, C could we agree that that there should have been something happening for the year for the year and a half that the that, that 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 we were waiting on the criminal investigation to unfold that that you can call it disciplinary you can call it whatever you want administrative. I'm sorry, y'all can't do this for a while. And and your time's up on that question, but have a few minutes. Yeah, yes, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would, if somebody would would, would like to ask the follow-up. Yeah, you can ask a follow-up. I'm not trying to make it a hard five, but I'm just trying to make sure we keep the meeting going. Well, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Uh, and and I would say that, that that failure is as egregious as the slowness of the investigation. I mean, if we got away, look, I, I was in the FBI National Academy. I, I was in uh, training with police officers from around the world and around the country, and I remember meeting a guy from the Northeast, and he was talking about civil service, and he was telling a story about one of their employees who was uh, indicted for murder, but they couldn't fire him because of civil service rules. I said, oh, my God, it could never happen in Louisiana. We, we had this argument. Well, I'm not sure it can't happen in Louisiana based on what we hear here. That we have people who, who are under criminal investigation for the most serious of crimes. Who, ha who, who we say, I'm sorry, you're under criminal investigation, so we're not going to conduct an internal investigation until the criminal investigation is complete. So keep doing what you're doing for the next two or three years and, and until the feds get ready and uh, to, to turn my DA loose. Or till the feds take action, but till then you're safe. I, you know, and look, I know that's not completely accurate. I don't want to portray it as completely accurate, but it's certainly the feel that that you get with some of this stuff. That that we hide we hide from IA because of criminal investigation. I, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you I know, make a I, comment? I just, I'm, I'm not in charge of Louisiana State Police, and I I'm not in charge of IA investigations. That's Colonel Davis, and so it's not my office at all. But I, do, I understand what you're saying. On that note, I do want to interject and ask you a couple of questions. Um, on the April 28th meeting, where you meet, you're welcome. <laughs> on the April 28th, 2021 meeting, where you get shown the Clary video for the first time, what was the context of how they presented this new evidence? It wasn't new, but it was new to you evidence. Um, where they say, hey, we were checking around our servers and we found a new video that we didn't know about before I mean how was this shown to you why you had not seen it yet is what I'm trying to get a so I think that part of, of your question and that part of what happened is under investigation I understand. And that, so um, as I respected your request to be here today I would ask that you totally respect respected. my position and that I cannot comment on those particular facts sure I understand that. I just trying to get a handle on it myself and I, I appreciate, appreciate that, that Mr. That. Chairman uh, representative Landry Hi, I just have a few uh, timeline questions. Your, um, the initial time that you saw the first video, September 2019, who reached out to you to 
to set that up or to alert you uh, to the to the video's existence? Yes. So, the uh, very good question. So, the my office received. Oh, let me back up. So, I, I have two parishes in my district. I have Lincoln Parish and Union Parish. The file was um, delivered to my Union Parish office. Um, I spend more time in the Lincoln Parish office, um, and so. There's a process, as you well know, in terms of intake. So once the, the file's received by, let's say, the receptionist or the legal secretary, uh, it is then processed uh, and then placed on a particular assistant district attorney's desk. Um, Cliff Strider called me and said, John, I need to meet with you. Could you say the name again? Uh, my assistant district attorney, Cliff Strider. Okay. He called me. Um, he said, I need to meet with you. Um, we have a case here that you need to take a look at. Again, uh, in reference to Ms. Uh, Re Honorable Representative Vilio's uh, um, question, I did not know anything about it. Um, it was not made very public in my area uh, for whatever reason. So uh, we set up a meeting, and for whatever reason, I, I had to cancel that meeting. He did not specifically say what was on the video. He just said it was disturbing. He did not explain uh, who, was, who the video involved or anything. This is your assistant DA yes. still? Yes. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was president of the Louisiana District Attorney Association and, and on the board of the National DA Association. Uh, I'm very involved in the community as well. So for whatever reason, I was not able to meet with him um, immediately. He called again and said, well, let's set up a meeting. We set up a meeting for September 9th, uh, September 9th which I think is about three weeks from the time that I, re it, I received it in my office. And at that point, we discussed it. And I think he said that he had made, um, he was in contact if I recall, with, with Miss Mona Harding or, or maybe uh, one of her daughters, I'm not sure. But uh, he said he was getting calls about it, and that's when uh, we were able to meet that day, and it was very disturbing. And As do I've you said, know or, or can you say who brought this information to him? I, I don't know if it was um, – no, I do not know, no. So we don't know if – if it was LSP or who from no, no, LSP. I do know it was Louisiana State Police. I'm not sure which officer delivered it to our office. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you know, um, it was just delivered. I mean, usually stuff goes by email, electronic, or, or it was, it was hand -delivered. calling for a heads up. It was, um, mm -hmm. Okay. Do you know, I mean, was there a call, heads up, or I need to give this to you, or just that, was... That I don't know. You okay. know. You're talking about from State Police to my office? Yeah, because no, I'm sure they bring right. you stuff regularly. Sure. Yes, but they don't deal with me. They deal with an assistant or a staff member. I see. Okay. So just to clarify, you don't know who from state police made the initial contact with your office? I do not know. No. Okay. Um, I'm sure I have that information, but I, I'm not, I can't tell you today what, who that is. That's fine was. if you don't know. Um, and then I heard you say um, at one point, I guess it was in communication with the U.S. Attorney's Office or DOJ, I'm not sure, that someone said, hold on, we'll be having indictments in September or October. Yes. Um, which office was that? Uh, Department of, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office. The, in, in Baton Rouge? Uh, in, in Shreveport. In Shreveport, I'm sorry. Um, and when, do you remember when that conversation occurred? Well, um, we, we've had several conversations. Right. Um, there's a... Uh, yeah, so that move has I call quite a bit. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. Uh, was that like that would have been September? Uh, excuse me, summer of twenty twenty. Summer of twenty, yes, yeah, summer of twenty. Oh, uh, Spring, something like that. Um, summer, of, summer of twenty one. So two years after the incident. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so clearly we don't have any indictments or or anything um, yet. It's been six or seven months since they gave the estimate. Has there been an updated estimate on? indictments coming or anything no no um but but there are, it's an ongoing investigation correct, correct. and, and let, let me say this too uh, in not in, in defense of the u.s attorney's office um a lot of times the the the, the dates for the possible indictments i would say possible uh, because there's no guarantee that that's going to happen uh, with respect even with the federal government so um i, I was told uh, on, on numerous, numerous occasions that uh, a new witness surfaced so look we, we need to turn over that rock mm -hmm. and so I get it yeah. and then as you dig deeper another rock they have to turn over and so very deep and, pond and, here and as well as you I know the members of this committee completely understand <laughs> right, <laughs> right and so the federal government is as you well as very detailed right um, and so I, I, I understand that um, I, and I, they I'm know that I'm very anxious out. about getting to that point and that's one of the reasons why um, 
uh, U.S. Attorney Brandon Brown called me last week uh, and said, John, I know you're frustrated. Uh, we all know you're frustrated, um, but we, we're going to go ahead and say, look, um, go with your case. Go ahead That's and initiate right. state proceedings. Okay, and then um, when they asked you, they asked you at some point to sort of stand down, was that in 19 or 20? So that was in 20 because I made the phone call in 2019 of September. The, the yeah, and I'm, I, again, I apologize for all the problem. memory issues. Um, but I understand that they didn't get that, the full file until sometime in February 2020. Okay. From the FBI. And when and when you had, you know, the sort of stand down from state police. I'm sorry. Right conversation. Your office had had already begun the process of investigating um, potential charges. So we meet on a regular basis. In fact, we've met the last three days. Um, this has been an ongoing deal in my office, and um, we're committed to bringing forth justice for the Green family. Um, and so, as you can tell in my timeline, I've, we've never stopped. Um, so you've, you've never stopped your I'm investigation into this, correct. knowing that it would come back to you eventually correct would that be the reason okay um those are all my questions thanks okay sure representative hughes thank you mr chairman and i'll be brief um da belton thank you for being here uh this morning thank you um just a couple quick questions, and to my colleague, Representative Villio's point, um, I, I don't want to do anything to impede on an active investigation, so if you can't answer my questions, uh, just let me know. Yes, sir. I know that the uh, federal government uh, is probably looking into uh, civil rights violations, but in my opinion, uh, I think there may be some potential obstruction of justice violations um, by uh, state troopers. Uh, is your office investigating that? Can you tell me? My office potential uh, obstruct obstruction of justice violations. We're looking at everything. Okay, um, and I also think there may be um, some conspiracy to destroy evidence uh, as we look at the wiping of cell phones by state troopers. Is your office looking into that? So that would depend on whether or not I have venue, and I don't think I have venue to 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 pursue that charge. Okay, that's all I have. Thank or you, Mr. Venue Chairman. Venue and our jurisdiction. Yeah. Thank you, Representative Hughes. Um. Did have a question and I forgot what it was. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there are no other questions for you at this time. Um, I, I forgot what I was going to ask you. I apologize, but it, it happens, I guess. All right. Uh, thank you, members. Is there any other co any questions? All right. That's it. We. Oh, wait, hold on. Representative Bilio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Belton, you mentioned Cliff Strider. If he's not watching, he's a dear friend, longtime friend. If you can please send him my regards. I will. He told me. Thank you. <laughs> In fact, I was with him on yesterday as well. So, Representative Marceau. Uh, just, I'm not sure if I heard you say, the U.S. Attorney said that you could go ahead and proceed. Yes. And when is that going to happen? So I intend, once I receive the information that he promised from the Department of Justice. Right. When do you think that you'll have that? I can't give you a time frame, but I can say this. I'm moving swiftly. You're moving swiftly. Yes. Okay. And Thank you very I, much. I'd like to know the additional information that they have gathered that I do not have. And I think that's important um, to move in moving forward. So Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your service.